of the Atlas Society Asks. My name is Jennifer Grossman. My friends call me JAG. I'm the CEO of the Atlas Society. We are the leading nonprofit educational organization connecting young people to the ideas of Ayn Rand in fun, creative ways. Today, we are joined by Mustafa Akiol. Before I even begin to introduce Mustafa, I want to remind those uh, who are watching us on Zoom, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube, you can use the comment section to type in your questions. Please make them short and we'll get to as many of them as we can. So Mustafa Akiol is a scholar whose work focuses on the intersection of public policy, Islam, and modernity. Uh, he's an opinion writer for the New York Times, a senior scholar at the Cato Institute Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity. He is the author of several books, including one of my favorites, Islam Without Extremes, The Islamic Jesus, um, and most recently, Reopening Muslim Minds, A Return to Reason, freedom and tolerance, which makes the case for an Islamic enlightenment, uh, not going against religion, but reinterpreting it based on freedom instead of coercion. Uh, he furthers that case in his upcoming book, Why as a Muslim I Defend Liberty, and we hope to get to that as well. Mustafa, welcome again. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Jennifer, and for this kind introduction and nice uh, feature of my book. So my books. Uh, so thank you for all of that. It's a pleasure. Well, it's it's really great to see you again. Last time uh, we got together, it was here in Malibu. I believe you were giving a speech at Pepperdine. And uh, it was very interesting to me. I uh, majored in um, international relations in school and uh, did my thesis on uh, on Jordan and the Middle East. And so um, I hadn't really focused on the religion. So it was, that was fun. It was fun introducing you to my, to my rabbi to get a little interfaith dialogue going yeah. uh, and to learn a little bit about you and your, your trajectory. So I'd like to, to start with that, if we could, setting the stage a bit about your intellectual and, and spiritual journey. You grew up in Turkey, uh, Still, I think we can say it's, it's one of the most secular Muslim countries. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the seat of the Ottoman Empire, which provided the uh, example of uh, a, a tolerant Muslim rule historically. In uh, Islam Without Extremes, you share a few stories. You share about growing up and learning from uh, your grandfather studying the Quran and how it fascinated you, but also aspects uh, that troubled you as a little boy. And then also uh, a, a sad experience of um, when you were eight, your father, who was, a, if I understand, a journalist, highly critical of uh, Marxist groups within Turkey, was jailed as a political prisoner for, for 14 months. So tell us a little bit about yeah, that yeah. and how those experiences shaped you. Well, Jennifer, thank you for, you know, remind me, reminding me those old stories, you know, from my childhood, which I guess related in the first book. Uh, again, it's, it's wonderful to have this conversation again with you. Um, now, uh, I grew up in Turkey. And as you said, I mean, I grew up in Ankara, later Istanbul. And my father is a prominent intellectual in Turkey who introduced some of the classical liberal ideas to the Turkish public sphere to the you know broad public opinion i mean he wrote about karl popper or hayek you know he was big, partly because he was anti-marxist in the 70s but then he moved toward to closer to classical liberalism so i grew up with that at the same time i my, my family was really it's not super conservative well just but you know fairly observant and then i became more involved into, I mean, I became a born again Muslim in high school, as I call it, you know, I became more intensely interested in re religion, theology, I involved with Islamic groups, but I ultimately realized that, you know, there are big problems in the Muslim world with the downgrading of the individual, with, with coercion in the name of religion. 
And in Turkey, you had that in a very little, I mean, level. I mean, because Turkey is a secular state, but you know, you would see certain teachings. I mean, the story you tell is that I mean, in my grandfather's, you know, uh, he's he's uh, rest rest in peace. I mean, uh, he passed away many years ago. But in, in his library, I had seen this namaz hojesi, which means guide to prayer, and it was it had beautiful quotes from the Quran, inspiring about God's creation and mercy. But then there was this statement saying, if you're if your children do not start to pray at the age of 10, then beat them up. So I was like, I was at the age of nine and like, will I be, <laughs> will this happen to me in a year? Like, so this kind of idea that you should use violence or coercion, and that's in a very, again, like it's in a domestic level violence we're speaking about here. And, and that quote wasn't from the Quran, but in a, let's say secondary source, as we would call it in Islam. So those kind of snippets. And then I began, I studied political science and Ottoman history, and I got into so I, the, glo- the political sp- sphere of Turkey, I gradually became a public writer, an opinion writer, a columnist in a newspaper, and I've been following the Middle East affairs. And I, I gradu- and, and the thing is, the more I studied the Western tradition and classical liberal literature, I mean, the first time I read John Locke and his letter concerning toleration, I said, he's talking about us, <laughs> our issues. I mean, he's speaking about that he's arguing that, you know, people should not be persecuted because they are defined as heretics, uh, which is happening right now. (laughs) It's certainly in Pakistan, it's happening in Saudi Arabia or Iran, which was apparently happening, which was happening in Europe too at its time. And it was a very new idea to say that heresy should not be punished. You know, it was a very shocking idea. Some people said, you know, why are, what are you doing this? I mean, there were critics of John Locke because he was bringing this dangerous idea of Liberty and uh, my my sense today is that with all that background and all the authoritarianism you described, like I saw my father get, going into prison, and that had nothing to do with Islam, by the way. It was a military coup, which was mi- nationalist authoritarianism. It was not about religion. Uh, but I am I have the conviction that today the Islamic civilization, parts of it, not all of it, there are, there's Bosnia, which is a pretty free Muslim majority society, but. Large chunks of conservative, you know, piety in the Islamic civilization is at a stage which is right there in the 17th century when John Locke or Pierre Bale or later, you know, Thomas Jefferson would, in the U.S., would proclaim religious liberty. Whereas you have groups who think, no, 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 we should persecute the heretics, we should punish, and of course, women should obey the husbands because because this is what God said. So uh, Christianity had that. A step forward. It was not easy, but it happened thanks to thinkers who rethought their religious tradition. Some of them challenged it, but others reinterpreted it. And I find myself in the letter camp, like saying, okay, we can rethink our religious tradition. And in Islam, issues are huge. Blasphemy laws, apostasy laws, uh, the idea that there should be a religious state that, you know, coerces people to be religious or that suppresses heresy or atheism. It's, it's very powerful. It's out there. But there is also a tradition starting in the 19th century called Islamic modernism. Uh, these, this, was, these, this was the tradition of scholars, intellectuals in the Muslim world who looked at Europe, saw many things that admired like constitutional government, individual freedom, freedom of speech that people can criticize their government, which was wow, and, and unheard of before you know, in, in their own milieu. And they said, these are great values and we can reconcile them with Islam. We can even find their roots in Islam. So I'm kind of taking that whole Islamic modernist scholarship and putting them into accessible, understandable books and articles and, and you know, lectures so people around the Muslim world uh, can relate to. Uh, so that's the you know, summary of my work. And my new book, Reopening Muslim Minds, is probably the most comprehensive thing I've written because I get into a lot of theology. Thanks so much uh, for showing it. And um, I get into a lot of theological issues in Islam because there are a lot of jurisprudential issues that is like interpretation of the Sharia. Uh, but then there's, there's even a theological layer beneath that. And, and probably you have seen some of those in the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is what I'm doing. And you know, thanks, thanks again for <laughs> welcoming me to speak about this today. Well, uh... Your new book, um, Reopening Muslim Minds, it, uh, it opens with a experience that you had about five years ago in Malaysia, uh, where a speech you gave ran afoul of the, the local 
apostasy uh, police and, and led to, to your arrest. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what happened and why you chose that to set the stage of the themes you explore in the sure, book? Sure, sure. That's a fun story. I mean, it wasn't fun when I was going through it. It doesn't it, but sound like it was fun. Yeah. It a fun story. Uh, this happened, I mean, this is the story indeed in the introduction chapter. I went to Malaysia in September 2017 for giving a few public lectures. And this was the fifth time I was going to Malaysia. Malaysia has become a hub for me because some liberal Islamic groups in Malaysia discovered my work. So they invited me to give events and conferences. And Islam Without Extremes was printed in Malay and translated and published in the Malay language. So I was there for this book events and uh, some lectures around it. And uh, I was supposed to have a series of speeches. And in the second one in Kuala Lumpur, we, the topic was on a sensitive issue, as you said, apostasy, which is, you know, giving up your religion, publicly renouncing Islam and choosing another re religion or becoming an atheist. And um, this is considered as a crime <laughs> in about a dozen Islamic states right now, in Saudi Arabia, in Iran. If you come up and say, I'm an atheist today, police will be after you, they will get you. You may even give in uh, the death penalty because that's how the traditional jurisprudence define it, defines it. Uh, Malaysians are moderate, so they're not sending people to jail or they're not executing apostates, but they're sending them, them to rehabilitation centers. So I say, well, that's not moderate enough <laughs> and yeah. just let people go. I mean, it's their conscience. And uh, I, I made a few arguments that I said, well, yes, in jurisprudence, in the classical interpretations of the Sharia, yes, there is a law which says there's a there's a verdict which says apostates should be executed but the byzantine laws were the same at the time the sassanid laws were at the time it was just the world the way it was because your pol political allegiance and your religious allegiance was the same thing so this was a, a phase in human history whereas it doesn't have any basis in the quran the only undisputed source of islam there are some bases found in the prophetic sayings, but they are disputed. The authenticity and the context of those are disputed. And I refer to some scholars who have progressive ideas on this. And finally, I said, religion is not something that you can really enforce if people cannot believe, if people don't believe in it. I mean, if, if they don't believe in Islam, you can make them hypocrites by forcing them to remain in the religion. Religion is not something you can police. So that was my punchline. And then uh, people were leaving and then these guys came in and they said, you, you're Mustafa Kiel. I said, yes. And they said, you said religion cannot be policed. They said, we are the religion police. <laughs> so they showed me their identity uh, cards and uh, their job is religion enforcement officer. So basically I had challenged their job. And so um, they let me go that night, but they watched the video yesterday. They decided I committed a crime. So they invite, they summoned me to the police headquarters. Uh, I didn't go, I was leaving the country. So they arrested me at the airport and they charged me for, uh, a, for the crime of teaching religion without permission from the authorities. And they said the crime is, I mean, the punishment is two years in jail. Uh, luckily I was saved through some diplomacy. But in, this in the beginning, I begin with that story to say, hey, listen, we have a problem here. I mean, we have people who think that apostates should be punished. Again, same people were there in Europe. They were burning people <laughs> at the stake. You know, and, and this was happening in the name of Christianity. But Christians at some point said, we're not going to do this anymore because it's absurd. It is not bringing any honor to our faith. It's defaming our faith. It will be tolerant. We'll be respectful and we will be still conservative our own ways. And I have no problem with that. People choosing pious conservative lies. Uh, it just should be not, not coerced. Uh, and of course, I use that story to look into what kind of arguments they're using and what are the counter arguments? Because the, the big controversy is this verse in the Quran, which says, la ikraha fiddin in Arabic, which means there is no compulsion in religion. It's a very broad statement of freedom, actually. But those religion police in Malaysia, as the Saudi or Iranian authorities are doing, they are limiting the scope of that verse by inserting parentheses into, into the verse. Then the verse becomes, there is no compulsion in religion only while entering Islam. Uh, whereas I'm saying there should be no compulsion in religion while entering Islam or leaving it or while you are practicing it in the way that you believe in it. And... And can we say that? Can we make that interpretation? It opens chapters of jurisprudence and, and theology, which is, you know, my book uh, gets to after that 
uh, first you know, introduction. Yeah, well, that's uh, very, very interesting. And I, I want to, again, encourage those of you who are watching us across our platforms, please go ahead, queue up your questions, get first in line, and, uh, and we'll get to as many of them as, uh, as possible. And so it's interesting, Mustafa, you're talking about the reinterpretation of that seminal uh, phrase to say, you know, no coercion within Islam before, but once you get into it, then, you know, all bets are off. And it does definitely seem like a departure because you describe the earliest beginnings of, of Islam and, uh, and clearly the, the popularity of the religion and in many ways, in contrast to the, the tribal culture, to many of the norms of the day, in some ways it was a, a liberalizing force. It was uh, developing more of a theme of individualism, um, of, of free will, of uh, individual agency, as opposed to kind of collective guilt uh, or merit. And perhaps that's why, you know, your book is, is not titled Opening uh, Muslim Minds, it's Reopening Muslim Minds. Right. And the, yeah. the subtitle isn't, uh, is a return, not a discovery, but a return to, uh, to reason, freedom and tolerance. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. maybe uh, tell us a little bit about uh, in, in what ways that, that arc has, has changed and, and those values have been uh, mm -hmm. lost and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. abandoned. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I should say one thing. I mean, I'm not making a romantic argument that in the first 10 years of Islam, everything was classically liberal and, and you know, or in the first set, it was a, it was a libertarian heaven or no, I mean, I'm, but what I'm trying to say is that when you look into the early Islamic civilization, you see certain, uh, you see certain ideas, you see certain improvements, some revolutionary changes that Islam brought which was for its time, a major step forward for human freedom. Uh, like what? Uh, if you read the Quran today, I mean, there are some passages about women that, you know, feminists are discussing whether, you know, this is acceptable or not, what it's saying. There are some patriarchal, you know, certainly at least language. But for the seventh century Arabia, Quran, the Quran brought women the right to have property and to inherit property which was, wow, I mean, people didn't have that at the time. Uh, the Quran brought the idea that individuals are responsible for their crimes and crimes are not tribal. It's not like that somebody from your tribe killed one of us or will kill one from you. No, that person is responsible. So the idea of personal responsibility of crimes. Islam brought the idea that when Muslims create empires, and I don't think they should have, but they did, you know, they should still tolerate Jews and Christians and allow them to practice their religion. Now, this was a fascinating thing at the time because people were not doing this. Like when Byzantine Empire was expanding, it wasn't allowing Jews to uh, practice their religion. That's why actually the spread of early Islam was welcomed by Jewish minorities in the Middle East. That's the story that people forget because they, they, were, they had suffered so much from Christians, which was very anti-Semitic at the time. I mean, Christianity likely abandoned that ugly past. But Islam respected Jews and gave them the right to not equal citizenship. I mean, not, not with the modern standards of today, but the practice, to be able to practice your religion without harassment, that was a major thing. That's why when Jews were persecuted in Catholic uh, Spain in the 15th century, Sephardic Jews, you, uh, you would know that story, they fled to Islamic lands, especially the Ottoman Empire, Istanbul, my hometown, has a Sephardic community that appreciates the fact that, you know, Ottoman Empire welcomed them at a time when Catholics were forcing them either to convert to Christianity or, you know, be tortured by the Inquisition. So uh, it, it was for its time tolerance. And also one thing that I emphasize is that early, in early Islam, there emerged this globalist or cosmopolitan worldview where Muslims said, we have our wisdom that is coming from the Quran and the Prophet. But wisdom is also universal. Humanity can discover things. So we can learn from the previous civilizations, the sciences of the ancients, as they call it, especially Greek philosophy. I mean, Aristotle, Plato, 
uh, Galen, all the Greek thinkers and their books were translated into Arabic. And that was a major event in world history. Uh, so the translation of actually Aristotle's books into Arabic and Plato too. And then at some point they got mixed by the race. I mean, Plato was confused for uh, Aristotle, at least in one book, but that actually brought Aristotle back to Europe through Spain at a time when, you know, Europe was not in a scholastic age and Greek philosophy was forgotten. So, there, but I think uh, those, those positive strains we see in early Islam either stagnated, sometimes died out, uh, and at the same time when tolerance or openness or cosmopolitanism flourished in the West. Like for example, anti-Semitism skyrocketed in the Muslim world in the 20th century, whereas the West finally was able to deal with its ugly anti-Semitism, which is still popping up here and there as, as, you, as you would know. Uh, or uh, the idea, I mean, Muslims were still tolerant to Christians but as secondary citizens, but the idea that you should be all equal citizens under one law, that became the global norm. And, and while Muslims, you know, had learned a few things from Aristotle, but, you know, ultimately rejected Greek philosophy, the world discovered whole new philosophies. I mean, from Hayek to, well, Ayn Rand and, you know, wh whomever you want to learn from, agree or disagree. So I think Islam lost the cosmopolitanism of its early centuries. And in the book, I try to show how that happened. And also, actually, how Islam contributed sometimes to Western enlightenment. Actually, the book begins with the story of Hay ibn Yaqsan, the, worst, the, fir, the world's first philosophical novel, as we know it. And it's the story of uh, this man who comes to life as a baby on an island and grow, grows up by himself and discovers how animals work and how their bodies function and then discovers biology and then physics and, and becomes a thinker and a philosopher and a moral person too, because he doesn't want to harm the animals and hurt them and so on and so forth. So it, it was this novel that showing that individuals without a society educating them, without a religious tradition enlightening them, still could be good and wise people. So this was a novel that was written by Ibn Tufail, a Muslim philosopher from Cordoba, Muslim Spain. It was translated into Latin and published in uh, Latin and then uh, English and then, and then Dutch and then French. And it became a bestseller in early uh, modern Europe and inspired Spinoza, probably John Locke and uh, others as well. So there are these ideas and, and you know, but however, there was a counter trend to this in Islam, which said, no, if people are not educated by religion, if they don't get the Sharia, they will have no moral value because human mind cannot discern any moral value, good or bad. So that became the more dominant paradigm in the Sunni world called the Asharite philosophy. So in the book, I go back and forth sometimes between Western enlightenment and Islamic enlightenment, Islamic enlightenment or Islamic civilization and showing that, well, we had the potential, we had the seeds we could develop those seeds, but because of these reasons, we had a problem, which brought to us our current state, which to me allows to say that, uh, I mean, a lot of pe people who are watching us right now for, might be from the Western world, Americans, you know, Western tradition. And, you know, they, some of them might be thinking, well, you know what, Islam is a very troubling religion. I mean, Christianity has made peace with the democracy, Judaism for long, but Islam is not resisting it. I will say that Islam is a, it's not a troubling religion. We are in a troubling era in the history of the Islamic civilization. If you live in 17th century England, uh, Europe, uh, in, in the middle of, during the 30 years war between the Catholics and the Protestants and the pogroms against Jews, you wouldn't think that, you know, Islam is a troubling religion. You would think that Christianity is a troubling religion. Christianity changed dramatically and uh, it was a force for good. So my book, shows how that actually happened in Christianity by accepting the idea of human dignity, by granting that there is something called natural law, that people, even without religion, they have a tendency towards ethics, towards good, towards justice. So that in itself can be a basis for universal you know, rights and universal natural, uh, natural rights. So those ideas, I think, became more strong uh, in Christianity, which helped the transformation. In Islam, we have the seeds of those ideas, but we have to work on them.
So you talk about the, the seeds uh, of those ideas and the, and the seeds of freedom that, that you parse uh, in, in the Quran. Uh, and you also spend some time talking about how those seeds did not necessarily fall uh, in a hospitable climate. And you uh, encourage readers to look at the, the map of, of uh, countries and peoples uh, of Islamic faith, as well as uh, arid lands. And there's a, a big overlap. Certainly there was even more of an overlap. So, you know, along the lines of guns, germs, steel, to what extent did the, the climate, did the environment mm -hmm. uh, shape the, the cultures into which mm -hmm. Islam was, was born? Well, I mean, that's an argument that actually we can trace back to Ibn Khaldun, how geography shapes cultures. And um, I mean, I, I toyed with that idea a little bit in my first book, but in the second book, in the new book, I emphasize something even, you know, something more clearly uh, discernible, which is, uh, which is the fact that, I mean, Islam has been under the influence of despotic states from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And it's the, it's the Islam defined by the state according to the interests of the state. And the interests of the state were hardly liberal in, in the classical sense of the term. Uh, I mean, you see this, for example, right at the very beginning of the story. I mean, one thing that makes Islam different from Christianity in, in its early founding was that uh, when Jesus uh, left this world, um, how that happened depends whether you believe in Christian theology or not, but let's say passed, passed away. Uh, he was, he left behind just a few people who believed in him, the disciples, then he started to preach Christianity and Christianity gradually became a powerful religion. And it was adopted by Roman empire in the early fourth century. And after that, so after three centuries, and after that, Christianity turned oppressive, right? When you have Roman Empire at your hands, you punish heretics and all the horrible things began. In Islam, that identification with the state, that merging with the state happened much earlier. Uh, Prophet Muhammad was a preacher, just like Jesus, you know, in, Me in the city of Mecca, he was preaching monotheism uh, in the midst of a polytheistic culture. And Muslims were demanding uh, in Mecca uh, freedom of speech and religion, you know, as I argue in my book, they were willing to be not persecuted because they're monotheists and they were willing to speak out against the pagan gods. So they wanted to blaspheme and not be punished for it. So uh, that's freedom of speech and freedom of religion, as we today in the modern world call it. So, but they were not given that. So they were still persecuted. And I'm actually in the book asking, well, what if the Meccans, Meccan pagans, allowed Prophet Muhammad to preach his religion and uh, say what he wanted and preach? Probably would have a different history of Islam. But what happened is that Prophet Muhammad had to flee. He had his exodus, if you will, uh, from uh, Mecca to Medina. And there in Muslims, um, in Medina, established a state and that state had battles and that battles was with the pagans most of the time. And there are some harsh passages in the Quran about those battles, like kill the kill the polytheists. Uh, it's not any person, it's not your neighbor who's a, uh, who might be a polytheist. It's, it's just that battle, just like some certain passages in the Old Testament. Uh, however, people take them still literally today and some people think that they should be implemented. The point is when Prophet Muhammad passed away, there, there is this history where he was asking for religious freedom, asking for toleration and saying to you, your religion, to me, mine. And there were some verdicts fight the unbelievers until they are subdued. So what happened is that Islamic jurisprudence, the interpretation of the Sharia, in a few centuries established that, even less than in a few centuries during the Umayyad Empire, established that the early verses in Mecca that is about toleration, that's about to you, your religion, to me, mine, are abrogated. They're gone. You know, they're they in the Quran. They're written still there. But they don't have... Uh, power. They're not going to be implemented. What's going to be implemented is the worst, which says, fight the unbelievers until they pay uh, tribute and they are subdued. So they, so you, you, you fight people. And that, that gave the whole idea of conquest and jihad and uh, military uh, expansion. Now, my argument in the book is that this idea that the peaceful and the pluralistic verses of the Quran had, has to be abrogated and 
the verses about war must be taken as definitive. This in itself was a state project because you had Islamic empires which wanted to expand. And for them, the idea that you shouldn't attack people unless you should, they attack you, which is in the Quran, wasn't helpful. You rather had you needed a doctrine to expand in the name of God, as other everybody was doing at the time, like the Sasanids or the uh, Byzantine, empire, Byzantine Empire was doing. So uh, I, I'm calling on reversing this idea that the tolerant verses of the Quran are sidelined and the more uh, belligerent, if you will, uh, or do domineering verses of the Quran should be upheld and showing that this was a decision made by imperial states. It doesn't have to be a abiding decision that we Muslims had to uh, follow today. Got it. All right. We have a little less than a half an hour left. Uh, I still have many, many more questions for you, but we also have uh, people in our audience who have some questions. So I'm going to start reading those in. And some are just asking for, you know, uh, because as you described, uh, Islam without extremes was kind of your 101. And then this is, is more of the you know, advanced uh, degree, but a lot of people are, their knowledge of the history of Islam uh, is, is informed by what we see on the news or social media. And so uh, maybe some, some definitions of terms, Vicky is asking if you can explain what exactly is Sharia law in the current context. Um, she says it's usually discussed in a very negative light and uh, is there, you know, any positive aspects of mm -hmm. it? Well, uh, I think comparative religion will help here. Sharia law is similar to what halakha is in Judaism. That is the idea that there's a God-given code of life to you that you have to practice to be a good believer, right? So, and there are some similarities. I mean, like we Muslims don't eat pork you know, observant Jews don't eat pork for the same reason, because the halakha has dietary laws. And we have actually Jewish dietary laws are more complicated. I, I, you know, I, I always respect being the people who are able to follow kosher in Islam. It's more simple. Uh, but, you know, or like the idea that boys should be circumcised, you know, that, that so there are, there's this idea that there is observance that defines how, how many times you pray a day. How, what you turn to Mecca and, you know, address code. Again, you can find in Orthodox Judaism and, and traditional Islam. So on that level, it is about personal piety and maybe a communal way of uh, behavior. There's nothing wrong with that. If people believe in it, they can follow that. So they have the right to do that. The problem, though, is uh, when you say my my God-given law also tells me to kill apostates or stone adulterers or, you know, punish people for blaspheming against God by beheading them. You know, you run into human rights violations, as we call them at the modern world. Now, uh, Judaism has, doesn't have this problem for the very simple reason. Uh, well, there has been Jewish enlightenment in the, 19th, in the 18th century. They changed a lot, too. But even before that, Jews didn't have a state for 2000 years. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you should stone the adulterers, which is there, I mean, if you read in uh, the first five books of the Torah, which is there, has not been implemented. And Jews learned how to just live by the halakha as a communal code and as individuals and communities, but not, not you, you, not, you don't go kill apostates for it and it's gone. So if, it's, if it is written there, it's not implemented anymore for 2000 years. In modern Israel, there's not a halakhic state. So, you know, there are some conservative people, but it, it, the laws are not there. But in Islam, the Sharia also became the law of the state. Uh, and of course, there was the Sharia and there was the, some, some form of secular law that some decisions that the sultans could make. But ultimately, Sharia was the overarching law. And also, it's, it got interpreted from this position of power. Uh, so why don't you use power for religion by, you know, coercing people to practice or, you know, punishing people for heresy or apostasy and all that. Uh, so th that's why there's a lot of elements in the Sharia that what we would call today the penal code, some of which are troubling. Uh, there are corporal punishments, which was the norm in 7th century, you know, it was what the world was, but if you still implement today. Uh, you will uh, uh, end up doing a lot of things that are shocking to the modern conscience. Uh, 
Uh, and, and of course, there are a lot of things about women, you know, must, how women must obey and serve their husbands. And I think most, most of that is also doesn't even come from the Quran, but it comes from the interpretation of medieval jurists. And some of, some of those jurists even projected back those ideas, I think, to Prophet Muhammad. So there's a whole body of law. So today, if you have a conversation with a Muslim, and if you say the Sharia is bad, the Muslim can say, what are you talking about? According to Sharia, I fast in Ramadan and I pray to Mecca five times. What's wrong with that? He's right. There's nothing wrong with that. And he, every, people have every right to observe the Sharia in that voluntary sense. But if, if you say Sharia is the law of the land, well, then it means you want to kill apostates or stone adulterers and that kind of stuff. And uh, of course, you might have a modernist interpretation of the Sharia, which is also something that I, 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 I'm working on. If you do that, the Sharia becomes just a set of principles of justice instead of literal implementation. We call it the makasid or the intention approach. The, actually, if you go through that route, the Sharia can give you a good basis for, let's say, human rights and natural, uh, natural law, because uh, according to, let me explain that in a second. There are verdicts in the Sharia, right? But some scholars were wise enough to ask the question, why God gave these verdicts? What was God's intention? And they ultimately mapped out five intentions of the Sharia, the protection of religion, life, property, lineage, and the intellect. Now, if you say, okay, these principles are universal, so let's look at the modern world with this and leave aside all the literal implementations, you might have a very different sense of Islamic worldview. Uh, actually, if you have scholars did that, they publish every year something called the Islamicity Index. They're mm -hmm. ranking countries according to the five values of the Sharia, the protection of life, religion, property, property rights, you know. Uh, and you know, which countries top this Islamicity Index? Not Saudi Arabia, not Iran, none of them. No, actually Muslim majority countries in top 50. It's Ireland, New Zealand, wow. uh, Norway, <laughs> Denmark. I mean, countries generally like in Western Europe or Australia, Canada, US is doing not bad, you know. So, um, I mean, again, this is a reformist, modernist perspective. Not traditional people will think in these lines, but there is this perspective in Islam, which is what I'm also talking about in my book. Like God says something, but look at the intention mm -hmm. and not... Look, don't, don't look at the context in, 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 in which this intention was implemented. Like the intention of the Quran, you can easily say the intention of the Quran was to uplift the status of women in that society. It was not equal, but it was pretty good for that society. But today, the intention is uplifting women, give women equal rights. So that's the modernist approach to Sharia. Uh, but, but I will, I'll be honest. I mean, if you, if I make this argument in Afghanistan, Taliban will come and show me that, you know, I'm a heretic and will probably punish me for that. So it's not that everybody agrees with these ideas, but these ideas are out there. Uh, and those, those groups generally, which are passionate to implement uh, Sharia through the state, we call them Islamists, Islamist political parties, or they are simply the regime in Saudi Arabia. And of course, in some countries, it's the regime. So there's a trouble. There's a trouble there. But I think the way to go forward is not to ask from Muslims to condemn Sharia, ask from them or you know, expect from them to uh, reject things that are done in the name of the Sharia and that are in violation of human rights. Well, that is a really helpful um, primer on what is uh, Sharia law. Um, you discuss some other concepts in your latest book. Um, the divine, divine command theory versus uh, ethical objectivism, not to be confused with Ayn Rand's objectivism. And, um, you know, in addition to that index of Islamicity, you cite a poll which was taken in uh, the, the world. Uh, is it necessary, it's a, not specific to Islam, but is it necessary to believe in God, to be moral, and to have good values. Uh, and 99% of Egyptians believe it is, as do 98% of Indonesians, 97% of Jordanians, 88% of Pakistanis. By contrast, 
only 10% of Swedes agree, 37% of Germans, 57% of Americans. Why, why is that important in terms of what you're talking about, this continued hegemony of, of a divine, divine command mindset? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for reading my book carefully, Jennifer, I should say that. And uh, that is in the chapter about, yes, the, that is in the chapter that is about the philosophy of law, right? In Islam, the, the philosophy of the Sharia. And here is, here's the beginning of the story. A few centuries, the first few centuries of Islam are really important because there all the big questions were asked and discussed passionately. And some of them were left aside, but I think these are big questions. Early Muslim theologians passionately uh, disagreed with each other on many issues, on several issues, but one of them is very important. That's the issue of good and bad. And the, here was the question. They said, God is giving us some commandments, right? Do not kill. That's also the 10 commandments, right? That's in Judaism and Christianity. That's a wonderful thing. Do not kill people. Do not murder people. Or do not steal. This is good. God is saying this. But is God saying these things because killing and stealing are bad in themselves objectively? Or do these things become bad because God simply said so? Or like helping a person who's dying out of thirst in the desert is a good thing. Can we, can we arrive at us with our conscience? Or should we think like that only because we find the commandment from God like to help, help, the, help the poor person? So uh, the two schools of thought was clearly there. And one school, the Mutezala, these are known the rationalists of Islam. They said there are objective rights and wrongs in the world, and God is educating us about them. So the divine commandments are indicating what is out there already, already objectively. So even if we didn't hear anything from our religion that murdering innocent people is bad, we would conscientiously through our reason, intuition would know that. Therefore, non-Muslims would know that too. Therefore, non-Muslims can be moral people too. Of course, they might not be moral people. So that's why religion is uh, here to warn us and guide us. And, but it, it's not that when you take out religion, everything will collapse. Whereas the other side said, no, things are right or wrong only because God said so. Actually, they said, if God says steal, then stealing would be good. Well, he said it's bad, so we take it it's bad. But whatever he says will be absolutely right. So it's called divine command theory, the second. The first view is called ethical objectivism. As you said, it's not about Ayn Rand's objectivism, but it's about, it's, it's a theological doctrine that good is out there. It's in, in human nature can discern it, good and bad. Not, not everything, but, you know, basics. Uh, so our religion is reminding and educating about these things. So people with people who are not Muslims can be good people too. That's why you can learn something from Aristotle, who's an infidel, you know, by Islamic definitions. We had a good theory on morals, right? I mean, and Muslims studied that, that uh, uh, virtue, you know, ethics of Aristotle. But the idea which, but the theological school, which said, no, there's no good and bad. There's no ethical value outside of the Sharia dominated Islamic jurisprudence. Uh, and I show how today this leads to conservatives who are thinking in these lines to assume if people are atheists, they can't be moral uh, because they have no religious knowledge. So if, if you have no religious knowledge, you are nothing, right? You don't have any, any wisdom. You don't have any virtue in, in you. I mean, a lot of Muslims who actually live in Western society intuitively see that that's wrong. I mean, I, it's, a, it's a thing in Turkey to say, oh my God, in, I don't know, in Sweden, people really stop at red light where we don't. I mean, that kind of like life experiences, that kind of stuff. I mean, there are corruption index showing that actually we have bad corruption in some of the Middle Eastern societies where you have more cleaner you know, politics in, in some others that are non-Muslim, that are even secular. But I think uh, this, this intuitional recognition should be backed up by a revived, the revived theology, which says good and bad are universal things. And of course, we Muslims strive for them. And, and we have a lot of great tradition on these issues. But we can engage with humanity so people can be good, even if they're not Muslim, even if they're not believers in God. Uh, and, and we can agree on certain universals of humanity. 
we're Muslim, they're atheists, but we can all live together happily and agree that, you know, there are some human values that we should not violate. In talking about uh, divine command theory as opposed to ethical objectivism, you introduce it in, in your book by uh, talking about your own experience as a father and uh, disciplining your sons and one who is taking the toys of the other and you say, no, don't do that. And he asks, of course, an experience that every parent has, well, why? And of course, it's very tempting uh, to just say, because I say so, which is sort of the parental equivalent of a divine command theory. Um, but, but you talk about how in both, uh, when it's just, I say so, or it's just, uh, God says so, the Quran says so, uh, that the, the individual who is obeying is, is deprived of, um, of the ability to, to reason through, to think in terms of consequences. So maybe talk a little bit about what are some of the, the negative effects. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you also talked about how you, uh, you see it when um, people migrate or when people who, who grow up in a, in a more authoritarian, collectivist, Islamic state uh, find themselves in a pluralistic democracy and they, they, they have a hard time adjusting. Mm -hmm. Thank you again for carefully reading my book. I, uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, so uh, in the chapter about divine command theory, I use this example of, you know, I'm a father and my kids, I say, do this or don't do that and don't take your brother's toys, right? And he asks me why. And I have two options. I can say, well, you shouldn't take your brother's toy because it's his property or, you know, it's his right and you will be offending him. You know, you wouldn't like the same thing to be done to you. So you bring in some golden rule, maybe. You try to understand your child that there are things he should not do sometimes in life because that's wrong in itself. Mm -hmm. Or you say, don't do it because I say so, I'm your father. Uh, so if you educate your child simply on the, I say so because I'm your father, the child will learn certain commands from you as, as, your, fa as your parental the authority, but will not understand why and will not maybe develop an ethical perspective on things and, and, and learn how to use his conscience and you know, turn this into principle and so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, I refer to some books about pediatrics on these issues as well, but that's not my expertise, obviously, but I, I use this to say, okay, let's look at into how we Muslims look, look into divine commands. And there are examples I show in the book that how the, this divine command theory idea that you obey without understanding why, uh, because that's what's supposed to be, how it leads to absurd decisions by Muslim, some Muslim jurists today. And I use this example, I show this example of a fatwa uh, a fatwa means a religious opinion. It doesn't necessarily mean about killing people, but you know, to, to, to make it clear. A fatwa on women's, women being able to travel alone or not. Uh, it's actually a famous thing. I mean, you might have heard that in Saudi Arabia, it was not allowed that women couldn't drive for many years. And now they are allowed to drive and that's a big reform. But the prince who does that also kills people for criticizing him. So that, that I'm not super enthusiastic about the strain there, but... Anyway, so there is this, in very conservative, especially Wahhabi circles, but even in some conservative student circles, there's this idea that a woman should not be able to go around too much and a certain distance, three day of a distance. She, she should not leave the home and without the permission of her husband, for sure. And without a mahram, that's called a male guardian, she, she, can't, she can't just go around by, or not, by on her own. There should be a father or husband or a brother, a male guardian. Now, where does this come from? It comes from patriarchal culture, obviously, but there are some sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, hadith, that are used to justify this. And uh, in the book, I show how a scholar is challenged on this issue. Uh, because you have hadith sayings of Prophet Muhammad uh, saying, don't let women go alone you know, by themselves. People ask, but going alone by yourself wasn't it a dangerous thing in seventh century arabia i mean if you leave medina and just walk in the desert to mecca there are bandits in the desert probably a woman walking alone would be you know would be 
attacked by them, raped by them, and that kind of stuff. So it's dangerous. They're banditry. So it was something to protect them from an imminent danger. So, but today the world is different. Women get on their cars, safely drive their SUVs or get on a train or a plane. It's not the same thing in seventh century Arabia. So can we not change this? And the scholar who gives the fatwa says, well, some people are making this argument, but no, the prophet said any woman traveling more than a distance of three days, and that's measured in seventh century terms of distance of three days. Uh, that's not a lot. So she cannot still travel. So my argument is that there are, I think, in every religion, there are teachings for a good reason. It, there was a reason for that commandment at the time. It probably ma made sense to people. That's why, actually, these religions boomed. I mean, it was a liberating thing, and it brought a lot of enlightening ideas and, and practices. But if you don't understand why it was said in that particular context, you end up turning a good intention into a terrible uh, constraint on human freedom, which is the case with women traveling, for example. And all those travel issues should be understood that travel was not the same thing in, in 7th century Arabia uh, compared to the 21st century modern world. All right. I have been uh, very selfish, not, not in, in a good way, because rationally selfish and self-interested would be leaving more time to get to all of these wonderful questions, but um, but I am very interested in, in, in your books and your ideas. And so I've taken the prerogative of taking most of the time. We have about nine uh, minutes left. So uh, let's see if we can get to some of these because there are some really great, great questions. And I'll be shorter in my answers. Okay, okay. Scott on, on YouTube uh, had a bunch of great questions, but one of them uh, is, should we see the recent peace deals with, uh, with Israel as a positive sign for the region? Oof, I mean, that's the politics of today. That, that, that's not uh, the topic of my book. But here's what I can say. I'm glad that Israel is making uh, peace deals with certain Arab countries. More, I mean, it began with UAE, Morocco, Sudan. Especially Sudan is good because, you know, it had an Islamist past. It's in a transformation. But ultimately, what we need is a peace deal between Israel and the Palestinians. If we don't get there the problem will still be on the ground. And I think a fair two-state solution or any solution that the both sides can agree, I know it's difficult, but that will ultimately be the way to bring peace to these two peoples who are there for, for 70 years. And I want Israelis to live in total uh, safety and freedom and uh, as they deserve, as I want for the Palestinians. And uh, I know there are maximalists, you know, who want to destroy the other side. And, and that is a big part of the problem. Uh, so I, I, I'm sympathetic to the peace deals, but ultimately uh, what, what will solve the problem and bring peace and no rockets and no bombs and no civilians being killed, that's gonna happen with is, uh, bet, uh, thanks to peace between Israelis and Palestinians. We missed that chance, unfortunately, in 2000, uh, but it's not impossible. So I think that's still what we should work for and hope Okay, for. Scott also has another question. Has uh... Saudi Arabia somewhat moved away from Wahhabism since the rise of Crown Prince bin Salman. Uh, well, he, he certainly curbed the authority of the religion police, which was an object of my criticism. So the, the oppression of women in public life have decreased to a little bit. I mean, on their dress code, I mean, there were religion police going around people with sticks and, and harassing women on their dress codes. So that's good. Uh, that is, uh, for example, people can have their shops open during prayer times. That's fine. So on a social level, there is some liberalization for Saudi standards, which is good. I, I, I'm happy with those. I welcome them. Also, he said a few things about not every hadith is authoritative and, you know, the most massively transmitted hadith should be seen, but others are doubtful, which is a huge thing, actually, uh, for Islamic truth. So I, I welcome those things. But the problem is, the guy who also does these also got killed, as, we, as far as we know from the evidence, mm -hmm. that a journalist brutally for being a critical. So unfortunately, we have this problem in the Middle East that some of the people who, cut, who do and some social reforms also prove to be political autocrats. Uh, and can we please have it both? Like, can we have... <laughs> Leaders, which will allow women to drive, but also not kill their critics. I mean, it's not their Saudi Arabia right now. 
I don't know where it will go. I would sup- I would be supportive of the social liberalization, but I would be critical of the political oppression because that in itself also might backfire too, uh, even on the in the social level. I mean, if you if if the idea that a social liberal can only be a political tyrant, you know, that's not good for the broad idea of freedom. Are there signs? Uh, Scott asks that the largely Muslim migration to Europe has led to more liberal attitudes among the migrants? That's his question. Or are there signs that it's led to a kind of a retrenchment? Well, I mean, uh, there are, there's a difference between the new migrants who just came out of, from a war zone and still you know, adopting to the new modern society. And I'm sure there will be some integration issues there. Uh, but I also see in the West the rise of a Muslim hood that is at peace with an open, liberal, free society. And I see that as a healthy, good thing and a sign for the future. And the best place for that is in America. And American Muslims are well integrated. I wrote an article in the New York Times uh, about two years ago, the creeping, uh, what was it? So people speaking of a creeping Sharia, you know, it was about the creeping liberalism among American Muslims. So there are American clerics who are saying, oh, our youngsters are becoming too liberal. They tolerate everything. They tolerate gay people. They tolerate people drinking. So wh- where are we going? So I'm good. I'm happy that, you know, some American Muslims are be- becoming proud Americans and, and they can be pious. I have not, nothing against them being pious. It's not about that, but they being open and uh, feel free uh, in the rest of society. So that sort of healthy integration is going on. That should not be rejected and blocked because of, of fears, uh, I think, with the migrants. Uh, in, in Europe, there are more problems, especially in France, for example, there are more problems. But I think that is partly because of the immigrant population, uh, like a colonial heritage, but also because European countries are sometimes not very good in integrating people. I think a welfare state, uh, instead of a dynamic capitalist society, makes people uh, not, you know, uh, partners of society. You know, that, that's not a good idea. Right. Some of the bans on religious clothes is wrong. I mean, you should allow people to dress whatever they want. Uh, they will be more proud citizens if they feel themselves as they are. Uh, so there's work to do, but I think uh, the, the Muslim hood that is evolving in liberal West, I think, is a sign of hope for the future because other Muslims can see, well, well, you don't need a theocratic state to be a good Muslim, right? You can be a good Muslim in a totally free society. Well, we've got just a couple of minutes left. So is there anything that I didn't ask that, uh, that you wanted to add? Um, or maybe tell us a little bit about your, your upcoming book? Uh, we covered a lot of issues. Um, I mean, there are, I, I have specific chapters on blasphemy, apostasy, and religious policing. So there are, there's, those are fun chapters in the sense that are a little bit grim too, but I show there are these harsh verdicts, but those verdicts can be interpreted in these ways. And by the way, this interesting scholar 10 centuries ago already had a very progressive idea there. So I kind of dig into Islamic jurisprudence, but show these things. Uh, and I'm not going to conserve every strict conservative, uh, sorry, convince every strict uh, con- uh, conservative out there, but these things has to be made. And I'm glad with the attention that I've been getting since this book came out. I've had events in Malaysia, Indonesia, Pakistan, uh, more other, uh, other things are coming because a lot of Muslims are also hungry for this idea of freedom they, they're proud of their fate, but they're not proud of a lot of the ugly things that are happening in its name. So uh, they need new ideas and new narratives. And I wanted to give them that. Uh, and uh, thank you for help, uh, allowing me to discuss. So you can ask me where they can find the book. It's on Amazon and bookstores, for sure, if they're yes, interested. And, and on Audible. I really enjoyed uh, both Reopening Muslim Minds and Islam without extremes uh, on, on Audible. So I'd highly uh, recommend you take a look there and you can also find Mustafa, is, is Twitter uh, one of the best? Do you, are you a social media person? Yes, I'm on Twitter. Akyol in English is my Twitter handle. There's an Akyol Mustafa, but that's in Turkish. So uh, you can, they can follow me on Twitter on my Cato website, uh, webpage at the cato.org Mustafa Akyol. You can find all my articles, writings or recent events. 
Uh, and I'll be happy to hear also emails. And if people have questions, they can certainly email me uh, through uh, mmakyol at cater.org would be my email. They can write to me there. Uh, I'll be happy to be in conversation on these issues because we need better understanding. And I think there are problems in the most big problems in the Muslim world today, but I think an unfair view of Muslims that some people I think promoting uh, in Western society is not fair and also not going to be productive too. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Mustafa. I didn't get to about half of my questions. So maybe um, I can convince you to come and join me for a, a follow-up chat in the next couple of weeks on Clubhouse. Uh, I'll be happy can, to do that. Yeah, sure. That would be great. And, and we'll publicize it there. So thank you. Thank you for this very, very courageous uh, and hopefully increasingly less lonely fight for uh, tolerance, for reason, for individualism, and for freedom uh, in, in the Muslim world and throughout the world. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. And thanks everybody for, for joining us once again. Uh, if you are enjoying these uh, webinar series and the work of the Atlas Society, please consider supporting us with a tax deductible donation and we will see you next week. Thank you.